We have a lot to do and say over the next six weeks, so let me jump right into previewing what the session is going to look like. Before we can do anything else, we need to think about what some of the aspects of language actually are. To do that, we need to take a basic concepts of the modern science of language study, linguistics. So the first week, interrupted by the Independence Day holiday, will be taken up with a very basic overview of linguistic principles. Trust me, this will we will need to do this for what's to come, and in any case, I hope that the information in this section will be practically helpful to any of you who are planning to be, or already are, teachers of language or, ling or literature. In our second week, we'll be traveling back in time and to remote places like the Turkish steppes, the shores of the Baltic Sea, and ultimately to an island in the North Sea called Britain. In the process, we'll encounter languages that are foreign to us, not because of distance, but because of time. Languages like Proto-Indo-European, West Germanic, and Anglo-Saxon. We'll also consider the first English language that gained notoriety on the global stage, a language that in spite of its historical importance, we still tag with the unbecoming name of Middle English. Week three, we'll see English very gradually moving beyond its Northern European homeland. Indeed, it is here that one of our core narratives for the session will become apparent the transformation of English from a, from a provincial language spoken by a few thousand people on the margins of the known world to a global powerhouse and lingua franca that is spoken in more places on earth than any other language. The encounter with classical Greek and Latin texts that initiated what we now call the Renaissance, or cultural rebirth, of Europe will have major impacts on the English language and how English speakers exhibit awareness of their own speech. But it is also in this week that we will consider one of the two most influential technological developments to change the language, the invention of the printing press. Weeks four and five of our session represent a sort of super module in which we consider the relationship between language and power, power in all of its forms, social, political, cultural, and ideological. I hope the reason for this is obvious to many of you. As England became Great Britain during the Renaissance, and thereafter the British Empire, the use of the English language became inextricably tied to systems of imperialism and colonial, impression, colonial oppression. In week four, we will have occasion uh, to view a part of that history that is now largely forgotten. Linguistic colonialism was first established right in England's own neighborhood in the independent nations of Scotland and Ireland. From there, it spread to the nascent English colonies on the North American Atlantic coast, as well as what was then the western frontier of that land, the Appalachian Mountains. In week five, we'll take up some of the other dialects of English that emerged on the American continent as the language came into contact with indigenous speakers, as well as immigrants from places like Germany, France, and Spain. But it's also in this week that we must necessarily remember that millions of immigrants to the Americas did not arrive of their own free will. And for that reason, the language that linguists now call African American vernacular English now has a central place in the development of the language, both in the Americas and globally. Finally, in week six, we will look broadly at how both the legacy of both British imperialism and the continued dominance of American forms of commercial media have established English as an official, and it must be said broadly spoken, language in places as far flung as Nigeria, South Africa, India, and Jamaica. There are cultural and economic incentives for people to learn to speak English as a second language, and this in turn has established English alongside Chinese as the language of the internet age.